That's good to have a professional do it to yeah. see to see how it's done. Yeah, badly. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Rachel Weissman is a lecturer of philosophy at the University of Liverpool and previously an Addison Wheeler Research Fellow at Durham University. She and her colleague Claire McCool from Durham University also are co-leaders on the British Academy funded project In Parenthesis, which explores the work and friendship of the philosophical wartime quartet Mary Midgley, Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foote and Iris Murdoch. Dr. Weissman, along with her colleague Amber Carpenter of Yale NUS, are also leaders of the Integrity Project, which looks at the meaning, relevance and importance of the concept of integrity across many spheres. Moral, political and even integrity in public philosophy. Dr. Weissman publishes research at the intersection of philosophy of mind, action and ethics. She's also written on Elizabeth Anscombe's approach to the hard problem of consciousness, the nature of the self and action, and a monograph on Anscombe's own monograph, Intention. In this episode, we'll be talking to Dr. Wiseman about her In Parentheses project and the four female philosophers that she argues constitute a school of philosophy, one which is regularly omitted from the orthodox canon of great thinkers or schools of thought. In her and her colleague Claire's words... The history of analytic philosophy we are familiar with is a story about men, and the male dominance is not just in the names of the star players. Michael Beanie's 2013 Oxford Handbook of the History of Analytic Philosophy begins with listing the 150 most important analytic philosophers. 146 of those are men. For women who wish to join in this conversation, the odds seem formidably against one. We have made over 50 episodes and 138 instalments of the PanPsychast over the last two years, never failing to bring you your weekly podcast dosage of philosophy. If you would like us to continue doing this, and if you would like to show your support, then you can pledge a monthly donation to the show at our Patreon page. Your donation will go towards the running and production of the show, and we appreciate everyone who currently donates. Without you, we could not continue to do the podcast, so please consider showing your support. Head over to www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast. A link is also in the iTunes description. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by New College of the Humanities. To find out more about New College of the Humanities, you can find further information in the iTunes description of this episode and our website. So in part one, we'll be discussing the golden age of women in philosophy. And in part two, we'll be engaging in some further analyses and discussion. Hello and welcome to episode 50 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the modern moral philosopher, Jack Symes. I'm joined once again by the problem of abortion and the doctrine of double effect, Mr. Gregory Miller. Hello. And the natural goodness, Dr. Rachel Wiseman. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for joining us on the show, Rachel. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Now, should we start off with our introductory questions then? I can't think of a better way to start, Greg. Okay, so we ask all our guests this, Rachel. Um, so the first question is, it's ra rather simple maybe, what is philosophy? That's not a simple question <laughs> at all. Um, okay, so I think that question is quite mm -hmm. often used to exclude people from philosophy. You know, this when you say, this is philosophy, then you're sort of saying, so all that other stuff isn't. And I actually mm -hmm. think um, any serious attempt to understand our world and ourselves and our place in it is philosophy. But mm -hmm. there's just a million different ways of trying to do that. So I can say something about the sort of philosophy that I do and the sort mm -hmm. of philosophy that interests me. So I think that philosophy begins from a particular kind of attitude to the world, which I would say is something like surprise or wonder or puzzlement or often irritation mm -hmm. <laughs> or annoyance, finding something in your world that either astonishes you or irritates you. Okay. And what philosophy is, is kind of trying to develop a set of tools and skills that can help you to understand that thing. Hmm. Um, so I think of philosophy as an activity rather than as a set of theories. 
Um, mm. And I think it's really important to think of philosophy as a distinctively human activity um, and something that we humans can't help but do <laughs> because whenever we live our lives together in the way that's natural for us, we're always going to find things that are puzzling or mm. wonderful or irritating. And that's when we start doing philosophy. So I wanted to quote this because um, Mary mm -hmm. Midgley is one of my big philosophical heroes and we're going to be talking about her today. And she very sadly died this week at the age of 99. And she said about philosophy, Philosophy, in spite of all its tiresome features, is not a luxury, but a necessity, because we always have to use it when things get difficult. Wonderful. That's a really good quote. Um, <laughs> so I'm really, so I find myself annoyed or frustrated with a question, maybe it's a question of ethics or something, mm -hmm. and it's the purpose of philosophy to help me clarify my thought and reach the truth. Is that, what's the point of doing philosophy? Yeah, so I don't think it's... I, I think the wonder starts kind of lower down than that. So mm -hmm. it's not that I'm sort of puzzled or or irritated by a theory in ethics or a particular metaphysical picture. It's more like I read something about somebody doing something incredible, you know, something okay. altruistic or somebody gives mm. up their life for somebody or my friend who I thought was my friend betrays me and I can't quite make sense of that because I thought we were friends. And so it's that moment of something happening in your life that you need to make sense of. Mm. And then philosophy is a set of tools that helps you to do that. So maybe it's a set of tools that help you to think about, well, what is friendship? Or a set of tools that helps you to think about human psychology and motivation, or a set of tools that helps you to ask the sort of questions that are going to get you out of that sort of muddle, mm -hmm. I would say. If philosophy then is this sort of set of tools that help mm -hmm. us think through like the kind of lived experience mm -hmm. in the world, then I'm guessing you're going to say that you don't think kind of philosophy is this thing that uh, makes progress. It's not like a science or something like this. We don't, we're not aiming towards something and yeah, we've reached the finish line. Mm. It's just. Yeah, think I think, that. I think that's right. I, well, I think that's right and not right. So the uh -huh. question, does philosophy make progress? I mean, you're going to find this a lot. I'm going to say this a lot today. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, so I think absolutely it doesn't in the way that science does. So to say, does philosophy make progress in that way? It's like saying, does poetry make progress? Mm. Like, no. Um, but at the same time, um, philosophers are always inventing new tools, just as poets might, that enable them to do new things. And I think, for example, that when Wittgenstein wrote the philosophical investigations he gave philosophers a whole new set of tools that they never had before mm. and the other kind of progress is when philosophers have got a set of tools and then they can set about refining them and making them more and mm. more uh skilled and technical and able to do the work they want to do now i think that kind of the refining of tools side of philosophy although it's a kind of progress it's a dangerous kind of progress because people can get obsessed with making this tool better and better right. and better and that can become the aim of philosophy itself and, and that can kind of bring people away from the whole point of having the tool so i guess you might think that some of the kind of more scholastic debates that go mm -hmm. on in the very technical branches of philosophy have kind of run into the sand in that sort of a way, I would think. I also think that philosophy is kind of always just starting off because if philosophy always comes from this moment of we need to make sense of this thing, mm -hmm. it's always responsive to whatever the particular difficulties either for me personally or for us as humans right. and so it's always just at the beginning <laughs> like, mm. which again uh, isn't a kind of progress in the in mm. ordinary sense. How was it you first got into philosophy as a, as a subject as uh, studying philosophy so you'd mm -hmm. say we you know I see someone asking for money in the street and that mm -hmm. prompts me to do philosophy uh, but outside of academia but how is it that you went from seeing or reading things about philosophy out there in the world and thought actually I want to I want to study this and, and, yeah. and really go into some depth so I was actually uh, when I first went to university I was studying architecture okay and I went to um a school of architecture called the Bartlett which is very much interested in 
kind of conceptual side of design and, mm. and art. And so for our second year project, we were each given a concept that we were meant to use as a starting point for our architectural explorations. And my concept was virtual reality. Oh, okay, nice. <laughs> um, and <laughs> it, that was given to you as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And so I was meant to sort of be designing mm. a building around this. But of course, I got completely waylaid. And the way I got waylaid was... Um, I started, I can't remember how this happened, but I started getting interested in the ways in which people construct stories about their lives Mm -hmm. and about the ways in which those stories can kind of be true, but also not true. And I read this amazing book by this woman, a journalist called Gita Sereny, which is called Into That Darkness. And it's a set of interviews with uh, Frank Strang, who was head of Treblinka Death Camp. Mm And she interviewed him whilst he was in prison in the 70s. And she basically gets him to tell his life story. And the incredible thing about it is he gives you all the facts of his life, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But so it's completely true record of his life. And, you know, and then I was promoted and then I got offered this job and then I, my child was born and then we lived here. So all the facts are there. But like the fundamental truth of his life Mm. is completely absent because he hasn't, he's not able to actually see the reality of his own life, which Mm -hmm. is his role in the Holocaust, effectively. And she really carefully and kind of gently and humanely reorganizes the facts that he's given her and presents them back to him in a way that makes him kind of confront that truth okay and it's a really sort of it's philosophy and practice really mm. what mm-hmm. she's doing you know and i just became really interested in this question of of how you can have a completely true record of somebody's life which is also absolutely fundamentally mistaken mm. And so then I dropped out of architecture. (laughs) I rang my mum. I said, you know, I was going to be an architect. I'm going to be a philosopher. (laughs) She went, what? (laughs) And luckily the philosophy department was just across the street. Mm. And I knocked on the door and said, can I be a philosopher, please? And they interviewed me and they said, yeah, okay. (laughs) So success story as well. Yeah, I know. Okay, so Rachel, do you remember having any uh, distinctly philosophical thoughts before you read Into That Darkness then? Maybe when you were growing up, for instance? Not not really, not profound. <laughs> I mean, I think children are natural mm. philosophers in the sense that their whole engagement with the world is sort of wonder and mm. delight and questioning and finding things weird and asking why, why all why, the time. Why, why? Yeah, so I think they are natural philosophers. I remember there's um, somewhere where Elizabeth Anscombe gets asked, um, we're going to be talking about her later, which of your children is your favourite? She had six children. <laughs> and she said, whichever one's closest to the age of seven. Because they're <laughs> the most philosophical. They, you know, Brilliant. you can do philosophy with them. Mm. Um, so the first qu- questions that I, re- the first thoughts that I suppose are more recognizably philosoph- uh, philosophical was when I was studying maths at A level mm. and we learned about imaginary numbers. Mm. And, and then we learned that you could use these things to build aeroplanes. And I remember just, I mean, I still can't get my head around how an imaginary number (laughs) like what even that could be and how you could use that to build an airplane so that that kind of led me a little bit to start having some thoughts i guess you would think of a sort of philosophy of maths type Mm. type thoughts um but yeah Mm. and then what was the first like strictly philosophical text you read then it Um, was it was descartes meditations actually and I have a slightly embarrassing story about this, which I'll tell you, but you don't have to use it. So you know how I said I left the architecture building and I knocked on the door? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, before I knocked on the door, I, I asked a friend of mine who was studying philosophy, mm-hmm. you know, what is this thing, philosophy? Because I'd kind of got this idea that maybe that's what I was interested in. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, yeah, it's just like you know, like thinking about stuff and, and reading. And I was like, well, that sounds great. Um, and I said, you know, well, what, where should I start? And uh-huh. he said, oh, you know, oh, there's this book. It's called The Philosophical Investigation. Uh, it's called, sorry, it's called The Meditation. She could read that. So I started reading it. Mm. And 
like I was halfway through it. I think I'd read like the first three meditations. Mm -hmm. And then I went and knocked on the philosopher's door and they said straight away, oh, come and, you know, let's have a chat. Mm -hmm. And of course they said to me, what philosophy have you read? And I said, oh, Descartes meditation, because <laughs> it was the only thing I'd heard. But I'd only read half of it. So then they were like, well, so what would you say is the main argument? And I was like, oh, basically he says you can't have any knowledge. You know, it's all skepticism. <laughs> and it, they were, of course, very nice. But then only when I read the next three meditations, when I got home, and I was like, oops. <laughs> They must have been very forgiving then. I, mean, yeah. I don't know what they were saying. Maybe they just needed more student numbers. I don't know. So I'm always a bit embarrassed about that. <laughs> um, we've got a lot of um, young philosophers or aspiring philosophers listening to the show. Um, mm -hmm. Could you offer them any advice? I mean, do you prescribe that anyone in an architecture building across the country should run out and knock <laughs> on the nearest door of a philosopher? No, I wouldn't prescribe that. No. Um, I suppose I, I would say philosophy is it's an activity that is best done with other people. Mm. Um, so I would say find other people and talk with them and then you're doing philosophy. Like you don't mm. have to be, you know, in a philosophy department to be doing that, you know, just sitting down and thinking, isn't it incredible that people fall in love? Like what mm. what is that? Mm. And talking about that. Um I would also say, like, sometimes you get this impression that to be a philosopher, you have to be very, very clever. Like, mm. it's all about being clever and good at logic and good at winning arguments. And I think that's a really big mistake. Um, I think, as I said before, like, philosophy is about being really puzzled and um, about being prepared to say to people, I find this thing that you doesn't trouble you deeply weird. Mm. Like, so be just be brave and kind of cultivate that sense of wonder and surprise and puzzlement and don't be afraid to to share it and then that's the starting point of of doing philosophy mm. you don't have to be good at logic i mean it's nice if you are but it's not, yeah, it helps, certainly but not necessary it's not <laughs> is there any uh thesis then rachel that uh you've kind of you know maybe used to hold and then you know during your philosophical career you've kind of abandoned so our two you know, favourite examples we like to use on the show is uh, Eugen Nagasawa, who, you know, was a atheist and a materialist. And then after starting his PhD, he completely realised, oh, I'm com completely convinced I'm a theist and I'm not a materialist. And likewise, uh, Peter Singer went from one version of utilitarianism to another <laughs> version of utilitarianism. <laughs> so is there any huge uh, seismic shift that you've had like this? One version of yeah. Um so I am a Wittgensteinian. So I don't Yeah. Yeah, and I'll tell you what that means in a second, but I don't believe that I don't have any philosophical theses. I never have. So I think, as I said before, that philosophy is an activity which is about clarity and understanding, mm. not a set of doctrines. So I don't hold philosophical theses. Mm -hmm. Um but I do think that I have changed my view on what that activity of clarification is and what sort of results it might yield. When you kind of first read the philosophical investigations, um, he has lots of, Wittgenstein says lots of things about how um, what we're trying to do is stop doing philosophy. Mm -hmm. Like the aim mm -hmm. of this activity is to completely dissipate that sense of puzzlement. Yeah. And the result of that is we're all going to be able to go home and not have to do philosophy. Mm. Um, and actually through reading and, and engaging with the work of the women that we're going to be talking about today, who were kind of Wittgensteinian in the sense that they had this view that what we should be doing is studying language in use. Yeah. But they don't think that the end result is that we're going to go home and we're not going to be, uh, you know, interested in philosophy anymore. They think that... Through this activity, you can actually gain clarity about mm. the human form of life in a way that is, it's not a theory, but it's going to have sort of ethical and practical implications for the way that you actually live. So I think I've come to think of the kind of methodology that Wittgenstein gives us as, as actually much more productive and ethical 
than I'd previously thought of it, where mm. I thought of it as kind of a, being a tool for stopping people saying things that were mm. silly. Um, so I've come to think of philosophy as much more sort of ethical than I'd previously thought right. of it. You say, I don't hold any philosophical mm. thesis. Um, perhaps I'm missing the point, but is um, not holding any philosophical thesis mm -hmm. itself a philosophical <laughs> yeah. thesis? <laughs> yeah, I know. Like people, I have a colleague, at Dur I had a colleague at Durham who always mocks me because I have this, what he has now labeled the no labeling requirement, <laughs> which is that, you know, you shouldn't label things because mm -hmm. that then, you know, turns them into these theories. And so he now labels my attitude towards labeling as the non labeling requirement. Um, but I think that there is a, a big difference between thinking that what the task of philosophy t is, is to, to generate theories that can be true or false. Right. And thinking that what the task is, is to develop a set of tools that can help us to make sense of ourselves here and now, hmm. where the recognition is that the something that kind of helps us to make sense of this situation here and now hmm. might not help us. 20 years down the line mm. or 100 years down the line and it might help me but it doesn't help you and so it's not the case that we're going to kind of come up with a position that we can all now look at and go okay that's done next problem mm. because we're constantly engaged in the activity so it's not it's about the process rather than what comes out of it at the end mm. Um, now, in a way, of course, you could say, well, that's a philosophical mm. theory, or you could say um, that's a view about the proper method of philosophy. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we might say, well, that's a theory, and so on and so on. And now we're doing philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Part one, the golden age of female philosophers. So before we jump into this section, um, Rachel, could you tell us a little bit about what this in parentheses project is, what we're going to be discussing? Uh, what is this project? Who have you been working on it with? Uh, can you give us some context to what we're about to discuss? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so about three or four years ago, um, my colleague at the time, Claire McCool, and I came across a piece by Joe Wolf in The Guardian, mm. um, which was titled The Golden Age of Female Philosophy. And in that piece, he, he was talking about what we can do about the fact that there's so few women in philosophy. Mm. So although um, if you come and do philosophy at university, you'll find at undergraduate level, it's about 50-50 yeah. uh, male, female. Um, by the time you get to MA, it's, you know, two thirds and then PhD, it's sort of a quarter. And mm. by the time you get up to the professors, it's almost all men. Okay. Um, so Joe Wolf was asking, well, can we do, you know, what might we do about this? And he pointed to the existence of these four women, Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foot, Iris Murdoch and Mary Midgley, who'd all been uh, students together in the same cohort. And then it all gone on to be these incredible female philosophers. Mm. And he said, well, one thing that's notable about those four women is they were all undergraduates during the Second World War mm. when there would have been many fewer men around. And he says, well, it's a, just a speculation, but maybe the fact that there were fewer men around and those kind of formative years of doing philosophy partly explains why they all went on to become professional philosophers mm. when that's a very rare thing, particularly for women of that generation. So Claire and I were like blown away by this because mm -hmm. we'd been thinking a little bit through um, our association with the Society for Women in Philosophy mm. um, and work we've been doing at Durham around equality and diversity. We'd been thinking about the problem of women in philosophy, if you mm. like, and suddenly here was a kind of a way into that that we thought was just going to be really, really fruitful. So we found out that Mary was living in Newcastle, which was mm -hmm. near where we lived. So we went to see her. Oh. And then we went to see her over and over and over. And mm. we've been seeing her every couple of weeks for the last few years. Wow. And talking to her about what Joe Wolf had said and mm. about what it was like and... Um, the project has kind of grown out of those conversations with Mary and, and with Claire. And it's been sort of a really profound experience yeah. for me mm -hmm. um, to be doing philosophy 
sort of collectively with mm. women about women but not on kind of women's issues yeah, right yeah. it's it's you know it's philosophy for everybody yeah. but suddenly you find yourself practicing it in a different way mm. um so that's the the kind of the background to the project and, and because of the way we're trying to model a different way of doing philosophy really central to what we've been doing is involving students mm. so we've had lots of reading groups for students mm. to read the work of the women we've got a website where you can download a reading list and tips about how to set up a reading group and we've got a blog which a lot of our students have contributed to mm -hmm. so we've been trying to kind of construct the project not on the model of sit in a room and do some research on your own but as a kind of living conversation that mm. we're inviting people mm. to participate in. Let us pause for a moment and hear a quick message from our sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. My name is Rob Howell. I'm a History with English student and I'm going into my final year at NCH. I'm 42 years old and I spent 20 years working in banking and asset management. NCH was a far more human institution than any other that I encountered because it's accessible. The academics here um, are, are rigorous but sympathetic to the struggles that people have. It is an institution with um, a human face and, and humanist principles. Coming here I was really apprehensive about my capacity to, to make the intellectual cut and I'm really glad that the tutors here saw something in me which I didn't believe I had which has proven to be a source of inspiration and endless fascination. And it's definitely something that I will be taking with me after I leave NCH. You can apply to New College of the Humanities directly or through UCAS and be considered for a scholarship worth up to £2,000 per year. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk. Think better. Think NCH. The link to reach the new College of the Humanities is in our iTunes description and on our website. Right, back to the discussion. You mentioned earlier, um, unfortunately, Mary passed away a few days ago. Mm -hmm. What was it like um, being able to speak literally to the person you're studying about? Yeah, it was amazing. It was absolutely incredible because she was somebody who had kind of stayed absolutely in the now mm. even though she was 97 98 99 she was always saying to us you know okay so now what are we going to do what's the next plan you know how are we going to sort this out she was you know she was always we'd go there and she'd say oh this book's just come out have you read it mm. you know so there was no sense in which you were interviewing somebody or talking to somebody who felt like the time was past mm. and this was now a historical project right you felt like this is a project that she's still engaged in yeah. now. So it was incredible. And it's it's just so sad that she's gone because mm. she was still somebody who was this kind of humane, sane, mm. serious, but also very witty voice, yeah. um, kind of just calling people out when they were being silly or shallow. Um, and we need a lot of that at the moment. Mm. So, yeah, it was a r real privilege. So, Rachel, your work focuses on these four women. Could you tell us a little bit about each of them as individuals and kind of their contribution to philosophy? So what, what, what their ideas were, things like this, maybe? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a really big and long mm. question. Um, but let me just say something kind of brief. So one thing that really blew me away when we read this piece by Joe Wolfe was that we hadn't known that these four women were friends. Mm. And I'd been studying Anscombe, you know, for years and I was writing yeah. a book. I just finished writing a book about her. Um, and we, we started asking people, did you know that these women were all at school at uni together? And people didn't know. And we thought, mm. well, this is an astonishing thing. <laughs> like mm. surely somebody should be talking about this. And one of the reasons I think that people didn't know is because of the way that the four women get kind of categorized when we start to divide philosophy up into different sub areas mm. in the way that we do when we're putting together a reading list, for example. Mm. When we start labeling things. Yeah. Yeah. Or just when, you know, not, it doesn't have to be, you know, malicious in any way, mm. but 
you know, you think of Anscombe, you'd maybe see her on a reading list for philosophy of action, mm. on talking, you know, you think about her in the context of Wittgenstein. You might think about her um, famous paper, Modern Moral Philosophy. So she's in that sort of box. And then you've got Mary Midgley, and she's in the sort of animal ethics box over mm. there. And then you've got Iris Murdoch, and she's in the philosophy of literature, maybe a bit of Platonism box. And then you've got Philippa Foote, who's kind of mainstream virtue ethics and the mm. trolley problem. Mm. So the four of them get kind of separated out in that way. It's only when you bring them all together and start reading them together that you start to see they're all sort of in conversation with one another and doing the same sort of mm. thing. So could you give a bit more detail here? You know, what were what were their actual texts? What what was their own philosophies? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So Elizabeth Anscombe, who's the one that I suppose I'm most familiar with her mm. work. Um, so she's really well known as the translator of Wittgenstein's philosophical investigation. And I think that that word translator really underplays her mm. contribution. There's an amazing story that Mary Warnock told us about the philosophical investigation. So the story, so Mary Warnock was about mm. five years younger than these women mm -hmm. and got to know Elizabeth Anscombe when she was an undergraduate and Anscombe was a research fellow. So the story is that um, uh, Mary Warnock went round to Elizabeth Anscombe's house and the, Elizabeth Anscombe's house was famously filthy. <laughs> um, so she had all these children. There were dirty nappies everywhere. Mary says, you walk in the door and somebody would put a sort of damp baby in your hands. <laughs> and uh, Elizabeth Anscombe would chain smoke. So there were cigarettes wow. everywhere, just filth. And, Probably um, good for the children. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, upstairs, there would be Elizabeth Anscombe's study. Mm. And um, Mary Warnock tells the story of sort of going up into the study and Elizabeth Anscombe was sort of crawling around on the floor in amongst all these nappies and children and filth. And uh, she had these little stacks of paper, mm. which were the paragraphs from the philosophical mm. investigations. Oh, wow. And she was organizing them. Mm. So it's not like... You know, Wittgenstein gave her the manuscript and yeah. she just sat down and translated it. Mm. She was actually helping him to order the fragments that he was producing. Mm. So I think translator really underplays yeah. her contribution to that text. So that's her major monograph is called Intention. And that came out in 1956. And that's an investigation, she says, into the character of the concept of intention. So what that word means but more importantly i suppose the way in which that concept shapes our lives is is one way of putting it and i can say more about that later maybe but those are her kind of most famous uh contributions mm. uh, the other is this very well-known paper that you mentioned modern moral philosophy mm. which is very little understood but also very influential mm. in which she sort of says look modern moral philosophy is completely you know, shallow and there's nothing in it and it's hopeless. Consequentialism is hopeless. Kantianism is hopeless. We need to return to something like a virtue ethics. And this paper is often thought to be the kind of the starting point of the model, modern revival of virtue ethics, that paper. Mm. Um, so that's Anscombe. Until very recently, philosophers never read Iris Murdoch. Mm. So she was... At the beginning, in the, the 40s and 50s, she was the sort of most famous of the four, mm -hmm. really. So there's a really, for example, there's a, a book that came out edited by Brian McGee in the 50s called Men of Ideas. Right. And Iris Murdoch is the only woman in it. <laughs> <laughs> and quite often, um, you know, there'll be collections which are all, all men and mm. Iris Murdoch. So she was really very ser taken very seriously but she couldn't really cope with academic philosophy and okay. she ended up leaving and now she's much better known as a as a novelist mm. um but her most well-known and important book i suppose is called the sovereignty of the good over other concepts mm -hmm. in which she argues for something a little bit like a kind of platonism her work is coming back a little bit now because she has this idea of moral perception mm -hmm. so this idea that she says a lot of moral philosophy proceeds as if the most important 
question in moral philosophy is is about what what I should do, how I should act. Mm. And she says, well, that's not really all that important, right? What's more important is how you see the world. Yeah. Okay. And so she has this idea that you can you can teach yourself to see the world justly, and this is what kind of moral work should predominantly focused on not thinking about action um so that's iris murdoch philippa foot wrote some really important articles in the 1950s moral beliefs and moral arguments Mm -hmm. which took uh fire at the kind of non-cognitivism so Mm -hmm. the sort of boo hooray theory of ethics or Mm. the prescriptivism of of rm hair she she worked on those questions that came up in those papers throughout her whole life and toward the end of her life She wrote a really lovely, very slim monograph called Natural Goodness, in which Mm. she tried to argue for a kind of Aristotelian conception of goodness. Um, And then finally, Mary Midgley. So she basically invented animals as a philosophical topic Mm. in the modern era. So she was somebody who... You know, anybody who works on animals and animal ethics and and wants to think seriously about animals in a philosophical context goes to Mary Midgley first. Mm -hmm. So she wrote a a really important book called Beast and Man. It was her first book. She was 50 when she wrote it. She wrote on everything, really. But I suppose her most kind of famous contribution is to animal ethics, which is where she kind of gets sort of bracketed if people are trying to work out where to fit Mm -hmm. her. Yeah. Can we talk about the historical setting these thinkers find themselves in? How did they end up knowing each other? And perhaps uh, where did they meet each other? What was the philosophical landscape they found themselves in as well? They all went up to Oxford. So Anscombe went first and then the next year um, Murdoch and Midgley and then the year after Philippa Foote. Mm. And... They all went up to Oxford just at the beginning of the Second World War, so in the sort of phony war period. And at the beginning of the university education, um, the kind of the con- the British context wasn't much changed. So although the war had started, it wasn't really affecting people's day to day lives that much. Yeah. But as the war progressed and as they progressed through university, Mm. more and more of the male dons first and then the male undergraduates Mm. were called away from the university to do war work. Firstly, Mm. kind of voluntarily and then through conscription. So it became very common once the age of conscription was lowered to 19 Mm. for young men to do one year of their studies before going off to join the army right. and postponing the rest of their degree and to when they got back, if they ever did come back. Mm. So the result of this was that for these women, they suddenly found themselves in a university environment from mm. which the men were largely absent. So the men who would have been left behind were conscientious objectors, uh, lots of refugee scholars who were coming in from, from Europe, people who were too old to mm. fight, and the women. And so they found themselves in an environment that was that was very different. They met, you know, in in the the college halls, you know, over dinner in each other's rooms. Um, because of course it was all women's colleges then, mm. so they were naturally sort of drawn to f- the women female company in that sort of a way. But yeah, they had a an a university environment that where they weren't kind of drowned out, if you like, by the men. Mm. And mm. Why this particularly matters is because of the 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 moment in the history of philosophy that they were part of. So they they enter at this kind of this amazing this incredible moment in terms of world history because it's the war and this has one effect. But the the philosophical context that they're entering mm-hmm. is just after the publication of of A. J. Ayer's Language, Truth, and Logic. Mm-hmm. So they're arriving just after this book has come out by a 21-year-old recent graduate, right? Mm, the yeah. real young man's manifesto. Yeah. And A.J. has written this book where he's basically said, look, all philosophy, all the philosophy that's been done before is nonsense, right? right? It's, it's not even wrong. It's actual nonsense, right? Mm. The only things that you can actually say are things that the scientists can say. Mm. And if there's anything that's in philosophy that can't be translated into something that a scientist could say then it's nonsense and it should be thrown Mm -hmm. out Mm -hmm. so 
there's these amazing stories about the, the kind of impact of A.J. Eyre's book, which came out in 1936, on not just uh, philosophers, but kind of the broader public. You know, it was a bestseller. Everybody yeah. was mm-hmm. reading this thing. And all the undergraduates were reading it too. And they were really excited by this, right? Because mm-hmm. it's such an exciting idea. And the stories like uh, Peter Strawson, I think, and, and uh, David Pears, they were of this generation too. And they tell these stories of of sort of smuggling AJS book into their classes and their <laughs> their older shooters throwing it out the window because you know AJS was basically saying you know all that stuff that the fifty year old professors mm. are producing is nonsense and um, Mary Warnock talks about this idea of this she calls it a newly weaponized I don't understand uh-huh. so if you wanted to win an argument, all you had to do was say, I don't understand. And then th- that was it. The other mm. person was kind of reduced to, mm. you know, humiliation. What this meant was when all the young men went away, mm. what went away was all the kind of AJ Air fan club. Mm. And who was left behind but the old men who mm. had been told, you know, who AJ Air... Throwing it out the window. Yeah. yeah. So, so these women were taught by the metaphysicians mm. and the theologians and the Kantians rather than by this kind of new modern philosophers who thought mm. that all there was to do was to get clear about language. Like yeah. They were taught by people who thought that there were big questions to be mm. asked mm. and that philosophy could help you to, to answer them. So I think it's what's really interesting is it's the sort of combination of the war but that coming at a point where there's this real generational schism in philosophy Mm. and the war takes away the young men and gives them this these women this very old-fashioned education if you like so Mm. mary midgley says that you know they were taught moth-eaten traditions Mm. that had all been attacked by air and if the war hadn't intervened they wouldn't have. They'd have been taught by Air and Air's followers. Mm. Um, so I think that's what makes it a really sort of incredible mm. accident of history that these women were all there together at this moment. So Mary Midgley said that it, because these uh, men were taken out of Oxford and, mm. and it was just uh, the women left and the old philosophers left or um, those who conscientiously objected to going to war, that it allowed them to um, develop their own philosophies. But did the philosophy develop in the usual way? Did the um, the way we do philosophy change at all? You mentioned at the start how you think uh, philosophy should, should be, and it's not with this pernickety, argumentative um, fashion. Did, did the women embody a different style of philosophy that was left when the men left? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... I think this is a really good question and it's hard it's a hard one to answer because all of these women liked a good row. Mm. Like you can't talk about Elizabeth Hanscom and say, Oh, she didn't like arguing. She was mm. very collaborative. <laughs> you know, she really did like an argument. And Mary Midgley the same, you know, she was very, very sharp. They had a very different view about what they were arguing for and what the point of arguing was. And I think it comes back away, you know, when we were talking about whether philosophy makes progress. Mm. And I'm, I had this distinction between sort of inventing new tools and refining the tools that we mm. have. Well, Mary talks about the way in which um, if you've got a lot of, she says, clever young men competing at winning an argument, okay. then what that generates is the sort of philosophy which is all about refining the tools that mm. we've got for the sake of refining them and being mm. increasingly good at manipulating these very, very intricate tools. Yeah. She says, well, in those wartime classes, we weren't really interested in that. We were interested in trying to make sense of what was happening, Mm -hmm. understanding this deeply puzzling world, she says. And and so I suppose in that context, like there's a place for argument, but it's not about being clever and winning. Mm. It's about trying to challenge one another to be clearer, to, to, to drop positions that are foolish or shallow or... Mm you know misleading and so the the kind of place of argument sort of shifts yeah um so yeah so she says we weren't into competing to win arguments we we wanted to make sense of what was going on so what comes to mind here is you might have uh people have seen people debate um big philosophers we had rebecca newberger goldstein talking about her debate with jordan peterson and william lane craig and that's a perfect example she was reflecting on it saying they were both very defending their positions and 
dirty tricks perhaps being played on stage in in Canada and the point was for them to one up or win the arguments whereas that might have been how it was in Oxford before what you seem to be describing seems to me more of kind of what Plato or someone had in mind this collective dialogue in pursuit of truth this honest oh you're right Socrates let's move on to this kind of you're not afraid you put your ego aside Mm -hmm. and you join the collective mm-hmm. pursuit of truth in the room. Is that kind of yeah, the, the I think shift that's, we're seeing? I think that's really nice. So Mary Midgley, when we were saying to her, what should we call this school? Mm. She said her suggestion was the re-Socratics. Oh, very <laughs> nice. Fantastic. Um, but we, I think that sounds like a pop group. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we haven't adopted it, but maybe your listeners <laughs> will good. want like it. it. Yeah. Iris Murdoch says um, that it's always the most important question to ask about a philosopher Mm. is what is he afraid of Um, and this is something that Mary Midgley repeats um, in her Mm. new book what is philosophy for but in other places as well and she says it was what's really clear is that what the philosophers at Oxford the male philosophers at Oxford were afraid of was looking stupid right Um, and once you stop being afraid of that and start being afraid of the sorts of things that these women were afraid of. For Mm. example, they were afraid of how the Holocaust could happen. They Mm. were afraid of losing a grip on morality. You know, they were afraid of not being able to make sense of each other. So their fears were kind of looking outwards to the world rather Mm. than looking inwards to this kind of anxiety around looking stupid. Mm. Um, And so I think that gives a different place to philosophical argument yeah the boys are back in town now but the girls are still in oxford what happens to the quartet then rachel and uh the way in which their philosophies progress and it continues to be conducted uh, now that the war effort is over and all these uh, you know virile young men have come back to Mm -hmm. oxford uh browbeaten by the war Mm -hmm. yeah great thanks um so, yeah, so in the sort of late 1940s, the four women are all living in Parktown, which is a little area in Oxford, and they're all pretty much on the same street. Like Mary Midgley said she has an attic apartment and she could see everybody else's houses out the window of mm-hmm. her attic. And they were meeting up in Philippa Foote's living room to talk about philosophy. And Mary says the main thing that they were talking about was what are we going to do about Oxford moral philosophy? Right. And that was the philosophy that the men were doing, having returned to war from war. Mm. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that was. So basically, um, this idea of that comes through um, the Tractatus, through Wittgenstein and into, from through A.J. Eyre, that what philosophers should be doing is studying language. Right, and making clarifications about language had been picked up by the moral philosopher Richard Hare, mm. R. M. Hare, and he developed a moral philosophy out of that, um, which he kind of puts together in a book called The Language of Morals. So it's it's all about the language. There's no moral content to it. You know, yeah. the, the A. J. Hare says um, there's no the moral philosopher shouldn't be putting forward any moral views all their job is to do is to clarify the language so clarify Mm. you know what these different words mean Mm. rm Hare argues that moral statements which look like judgment so when i say you know don't do that it's wrong or you know murder is bad or something it looks Mm. like i'm making a judgment but he said well you're not making a judgment actually it's a kind of prescription it's like a rule uh like an order Mm. Anyway, he develops an account of moral philosophy around that. But crucially, it turns out on this view that there are no objective moral judgments. Right. So anything, anything that you say is ultimately justified by appeal to your own moral principles. Mm. But you and I might have completely different moral principles. And when that happens, all we can do is say, well, you've got these principles. I've got my principles. According to yours, it's right. According yeah. to mine, it's wrong. Oh dear, never mind. So, in the context of it, we've got these men coming back. News of the Holocaust is coming. Yeah, out, news exactly. Of the war, and we've got AJ saying, "Oh, you saying the Holocaust is, is a bad thing? Is just you saying, boo, I don't like yeah. the Holocaust.' Emotion. That's just you expressing emotion. Yeah. And Hare saying, you know, the Holocaust is wrong.' He's saying, "Oh, you're just trying to 
prescribe your moral principles onto me. There's yeah. no actual fact of the matter. Yeah. And this this is amazing, quite shocking, I imagine. To, it is to shocking. I think it's still shocking mm. now. And, you know, Philip Foot writing about it in the 90s said, you know, we just knew it couldn't be that way. You know, mm. we knew that faced with a Nazi, we had to be able to say we were right and you were wrong. Yeah. And for that to be true mm. and it not to come down to, you know, them having a different set of moral principles to us and, mm. oh, well, we just have to agree to disagree. So their project becomes, well, how are we going to recover the possibility of saying that, if mm. you like? Good. And so they start with where Ayer starts, in a way, with the fact-value di dichotomy mm. and with uh, an attempt to get rid of that because I think it's only once we got rid of that that we're going to be mm. able to recover the idea that moral judgments are properly about the world. So his fact value dichotomy is so there's things which are facts, things we can test through science, and anything else is values just they're not actual things. It's just um it's just nonsense. Or, yeah. or, or it's just emotions or expressing exactly. one's inner beliefs or exactly, something. Exactly, exactly. It is an art. Mm. So that's so that's kind of their starting point is the Mary says Mary Mitchell says, you know, the starting point is a joint no. Yeah. And the no, I think, is really interesting from a philosophical perspective, because it's not a sort of, you know, oh, here's a good argument against a theory. Right. The no is a kind of ethical human no. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a it can't it can't be this way because we can't live like that that's not how we live you know so the, the no comes from a, a kind of a human no rather than a sort of technical philosophical argument it's just no we're not having that how are we gonna provide something different and so then they all set to work on that in a way and when you read their papers from the early 1950s to the mid 1950s you can see although they're not referencing one another mm. you can see them all emerging out of the this same project these same kind of conversations after the 1950s they kind of dispersed to different parts of the country um they stay friends in to different degrees there's a very deep and lasting friendship mm. between philippa foot and Iris Murdoch, and between Philippa Foote and Elizabeth Anscombe. Iris Murdoch is um, Mary Mitchell's bridesmaid. So they have kind of intertwined lives in a way, mm. but their philosophy takes off in different directions. But mm. I think that early sort of no remains with them, and also a shared sense of what it would be to, uh, what the project of, of underpinning that no might look like. Mm. It's a good job they didn't meet uh, at Anscombe's house then. <laughs> it's filthy. <laughs> you can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sci Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sci Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>